Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and today we're going to discuss some of the more bizarre discoveries in regards to quantum physics and in regards to the reality we find ourselves in. And that's because modern physics provides us with the most successful description of the universe at its most fundamental level, the quantum level. The idea and the theories underpinning all of the technologies we use today from lasers to miniature computer chips and even probably the display that you're watching this on, explaining the stability of matter itself and explaining how everything seems to interact with everything else. But despite the empirical success, quantum mechanics presents a deeply puzzling picture of reality, one where even the modern physicists don't really agree on the fundamental explanation and the fundamental meaning. And for decades now, or actually more like for over a century, this led to some profound questions and to some of the most radical explanations and propositions, including some really exciting groundbreaking experiments in the history of science. And so today, in this video, we're going to explore some of these interconnected areas, focusing on how we understand the reality of the world and how everything was redefined with some of these quantum discoveries. But to begin, let's start with this quantum world and the mystery at its core. And here we're talking about the realm of very, very small. The world that operates on entirely different physics from our everyday experience. And that's because in the world as we know it, classical objects generally have very specific properties such as precise position and precise mass or weight or momentum. But in quantum mechanics, most things are described with something known as wave function. And this wave function only represents a cloud of possibilities but nothing exact. And until we measure something, a quantum object can exist in a superposition, being in multiple states or locations simultaneously. This bizarre phenomenon has been sort of confirmed in previous experiments many, many times. With the most vivid implication of this being the famous Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. The principle that states that you cannot predict both position and momentum at the same time, at least when it comes to super tiny things. And we recently discussed one of the major experiments from the MIT that sort of confirms all of this once again. The video about this should be in the description. But when we observe a quantum object, its hazy existence is said to collapse. And it collapses into a single, well-defined state resembling our classical world. In physics, this is referred to as the wave function collapse. And surprisingly, this represents a central unresolved issue in quantum theory. For example, what exactly constitutes a measurement and how does our definite shared reality emerge from this inherent quantum fuzziness? And so this fundamental ambiguity led to significant debates lasting for many decades. With a recent survey by Nature magazine involving 1100 quantum researchers surprisingly revealing a widespread disagreement on what exactly the wave function represents and of course what all of this means. And strangely enough, approximately 36% of these researchers believe that this is something real and physical, whereas approximately 47% believe that this is something only useful for calculation. And the origins of this debate go back all the way to Einstein and Bohr. For example, Einstein argued for pre-existing reality, whereas others like Bohr and Heisenberg focused on predictions for what would be measured, ignoring reality whatsoever. And this perspective eventually formed what's known as the Copenhagen interpretation, which is actually one of the most widely taught interpretations of this phenomenon. But many physicists express reservations about its completeness. And in a nutshell, this interpretation developed by Niels Bohr in the 1920s says that tiny particles like electrons and photons do not exist in one definite state until we measure them. Instead, they exist in a kind of a superposition. But when we observe something, or when we measure something, it seems to choose one specific state. And that's the outcome we then observe. And so here in these propositions, the act of observation seems to play a key role in determining the state of a quantum particle. And so here, the quantum physics is all about predicting what we will observe and not about describing the reality independent of measurements. But moreover, approximately 45% of researchers also believe that there seems to be a very clear boundary between the classical and the quantum world. Although here, surprisingly, the other 45% also believe there is no boundary. 
10% remain uncertain. And when it comes to other interpretations, one of the most bizarre and also one of the most exciting, but possibly most difficult to prove interpretations is the so-called many worlds interpretation. Here only about 15% seem to think it's true. This is the idea behind the parallel universes. But interestingly, a lot of physicists tend to adopt what's known as the shut up and calculate approach. They don't really philosophize about it too much, and they don't really try to find the exact explanation. They just focus on math. But once again, the main point of the survey was to show that there seem to be a lot of divides, even in the quantum physicist community, on what exactly causes what. Even when it comes to the wave function, there is really no exact answer and no widely accepted proposition. But beyond superposition and beyond wave function collapse, we also have something known as entanglement. A phenomenon where two or more particles become intrinsically linked, independent of distance between them. And here experiments have definitively shown that by affecting one of these particles, the other one gets the effect as well. And this non-local connection led Einstein to provide one of the biggest critiques to this idea. Because it basically suggested that there was a tension between his theory of relativity that limited the speed of light and the propositions from quantum physics in regards to entanglement. But here experiments have definitively showed us that entanglement is indeed real and that the universe does not seem to be locally real, in the way classical physics assumes. And though this also proves that faster than light communication is unlikely to be real, at the same time this suggests that entangled quantum systems cannot be understood as separate parts, but instead seem to be indivisible units. But one of the main reasons why this is not really related to faster than speed of light travel is because here it would require, once again, measurements. And so you do need to have classical communication, which is limited by the speed of light, in order to compare and confirm these results, and in order to establish that the particles are indeed entangled. And so basically, even when it comes to entangled particles, there is this bizarre wave function that needs to be considered. And today we have so much experimental evidence for the idea of entanglement, including experiments over very large distances, even involving satellites 1200 kilometers away. And a lot of these experiments and a lot of this evidence was eventually recognized with a Nobel Prize back in 2022. But here one question still kind of remains. If a lot of these quantum effects seem to be fundamental, why don't we actually observe superposition or even entanglement in the macroscopic life, basically life around us. And well, for many years the answer was decoherence. Here, environmental disturbances seem to cause a lot of these quantum states to quickly collapse and then become classical ones. And the larger the object, the more susceptible it seems to be. But in the last few years, some of the scientists decided to focus on answering a very simple question. How large or how small does an object have to be? in order to become decoherent, or basically in order to transition from the quantum state to the classical state. Is there an actual upper size limit? And while by isolating systems from environmental disturbances, usually involving a lot of lasers and super cold conditions, and usually involving laboratories creating some of the quietest and some of the coldest places in the entire universe, researchers were able to create quantum effects in larger and larger objects. And here we had quite a few different experiments. For example, it was possible to create a clump of thousands of different organic compounds, very similar to a tiny protein, that was then turned quantum in some of these super cold conditions. It was also possible to create a wave-like nature inside a 100 nanometer glass bead containing billions of atoms. But more recently, in 2023, researchers used a 16 microgram sapphire crystal and were able to create a superposition state of this somewhat unusual object. So basically they turned this crystal into a kind of a Schrodinger's cat. Here this crystal was vibrating in two different directions and was technically the largest object to be ever turned quantum. It contained 100 million billion atoms. And a lot of this relates to a somewhat intriguing model proposed a while back. A model referred to as GRW, Girardi Rimini Weber model, that says that certain particles don't just follow the usual quantum rules smoothly all the time, Instead, they randomly collapse their wave functions at spontaneous moments without needing an observer. And the model also states that these collapses seem to happen extremely rarely for single particles, but as the object grows larger and becomes more complex, these collapses seem to happen often enough to explain why we don't really see quantum superpositions in everyday life. And so this model is actually interesting because it explains everything 
without the need for the observer, making quantum mechanics just a little bit more objective. And so a lot of these experiments seem to be below the predicted threshold for this model, but seem to be close enough. But if correct, this would also imply that the ideas we have about quantum physics is obviously not complete and not final. It seems to require additional modifications. But studying quantum physics is also important for another theory of physics, the so-called standard model. And that's because the standard model of particle physics seems to be incomplete as well. For example, it lacks the explanations for dark matter, lacks the explanations for what exactly gravity is, and does not explain masses of neutrinos. It also contains a few other problems, like for example, inability to explain and provide the exact energy density for dark energy, and requires a lot of modifications. And so since a lot of particle colliders, such as the Large Hadron Collider, have not detected anything new so far, this sort of creates a bit of a crisis for this theory as well. And so here, some of the potential propositions also seem to come from maybe quantum physics. Specifically the idea that maybe physics is just vastly different at different energy scales, from the smallest things to the largest. And so for example when it comes to gravity, new quantum gravity theories that are being developed right now could maybe integrate some of the explanations from the standard model with what happens on the quantum scale. This hasn't been successful yet, but it's been worked on by a lot of physicists. But I guess most importantly, in the standard model, the universe seems to contain a smooth space-time structure, kind of related to the classical general relativity proposed by Einstein. But that's not the universe described by quantum physics. In the quantum world, we have a lot of tiny scale interactions that are probabilistic and that do not create smooth space-time at all. And so right now there is just no connection between these two particular fields. But nevertheless, even after a century, quantum physics is still the most accurate description of the microscopic world, despite the fact that we don't really fully understand it yet and still have trouble wrapping our heads around what all of this means. And though some of the possible answers could be achieved by discovering the macroscopic quantum effects, or basically turning large objects into quantum objects, right now the experiments have not been conclusive yet. Which of course implies that our understanding of reality is not yet complete. But these are also not merely philosophical discussions, they drive cutting edge experiments and inspire new theoretical frameworks that continuously reshape our evolving picture of cosmos and provide new technologies for us to use in daily lives. But at the same time, this also sort of redefines our most fundamental conceptions of our existence. So basically, why do we exist? And why are we not Schrodinger's cats at all times? And so here we just have to remember that this idea of quantum physics forces us to reconsider what reality means. Moving away from a fixed observer independent world to one that is fundamentally based on probability and requires some kind of an observer or a process in order to create reality. But one of the main reasons I wanted to discuss this is because 2025, or the year when I'm making this, has officially been designated as the International Year of quantum science and technology. This was to celebrate 100 years since the initial development of quantum mechanics, because all of this started back in 1925. And here we're essentially just celebrating the significant progress and a lot of achievements in the last 100 years. They're actually expected to have dramatic effects on anything from biological sciences and chemical sciences to things like entertainment and finances. Which also means that we're probably going to be discussing some of the quantum discoveries in the next few months, just because this is probably the best year to talk about all of this. And so until future discoveries, at least for now, that's all I wanted to discuss. Thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads and can DM me directly, or by joining the channel membership that can grant you early access. Alternatively, you can also buy the wonderful person t-shirt in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.